I had auditions, probably about 230 auditions. My and goodness. I sat there for hours and hours and um and I finally found Graham Mack and he read my book. <laughs> She shivered against the cold as she watched the man bring the horse to a stop. When he saw Hannah, he seemed to look just slightly away from her, as if he were talking to the side of the cabin rather than to her. She knew he was afraid. The stench of fear smelled like rotting meat, and somehow Hannah sensed every part of it. Where do you want it? he asked. Around back. You'll see where the other wood used to be. She tilted her head and grinned. And what about your payment? He looked away quickly toward the back of the cabin. Just a buck or two, I reckon, he said. If you want, I can come by every two weeks or so and make sure you don't run out. She gave him a curt, business-like nod. That'll be just fine. The man whipped the horse into motion and steered it to the back of the cabin while Hannah went inside and took two dollars from the candy tin. You think this is too much? She asked old Boreas as he watched her every move. He pecked two times at the floor and followed her closely when she went back to the door and opened it. She could feel the black rooster watching her as she placed the two dollars on the bottom porch step. She lingered a bit listening to the sound of the man at work behind the cabin. The soft thudding noise and occasional clicking sound of wood being stacked seemed to warm her heart more than any fire ever could. She looked back at old Boreas. It should be a fine payment, the rooster pecked again and continued to watch her. When she went back inside, she stayed by the window until the wagon was pulled back across the yard. The bit of snow that had gathered on the ground during the flurries of the day showed the path of its progression to and from her yard. As the man headed back into Trumbull with dusk not too far behind, Hannah laughed heartily as if someone had told her some great joke. It came out of nowhere and actually startled her a bit at first. But then both her lungs and heart leaned into it and the laughter came even harder and with more joy. Looking through the window at the approaching night, she continued to laugh. And when she was able to draw a proper breath, she uttered four words that were beginning to rotate in her head like a chant, maybe a prayer. Let them fear you. Trace Marillo, how are you? I am fine, how are you? Very good. First of all, did I say your name right? Yes, you did. Excellent. And um, there's no need for a fire extinguisher, is there? That's... There is no need. <laughs> what, you're doing, what you're doing behind is you're creating there with the log fire, you're creating this intimate fireside chat atmosphere <laughs> for, our, for our chat about your terrific book, The Witch of Munro. And is it, are you going with The, the Witch of Munro or The Witch of Munro? The Witch of Monroe. The okay, as in Marilyn. Okay, The Witch of Monroe. And where are you right now? I live in Asheville, North Carolina, in the mountains. Is it that's now that sounds nice? I like mountain environment, mountains it's and deserts. Beautiful. I tend to like. Yeah, Asheville is absolutely beautiful. So it sounds like a proper writer's retreat type location. It is. I yeah. love it here. I would never leave the mountains. <laughs> really? But you're not a native of there. You were born in Florida, weren't you? In Tampa. That is, or you grew up there. I was. Yeah, yeah, I grew up. I was born in Tampa. I grew up in Tampa. My family originated from Georgia. So okay. I grew up very Southern. And um, then I moved to Pensacola, Florida, which is like the panhandle of Florida. And then I settled in North Carolina, where I hope to live out my days. I love it here. North Carolina is a state I've not visited. Florida I've visited. Tampa I've been to as a tourist. I went to Bush Gardens. But uh, so um, how did you end up in North Carolina? What, what took you there from Florida? 
It's a very funny story. My daughter um, was going to NC State, which is the university, one of the universities here. Um, and it was cheaper for her to live at home. So we, I wanted to leave Florida and I said, you know what, let's move to North Carolina. And when we got here, I absolutely loved it. Was it just you and her or was there a bloke or a partner involved as well? My husband. So, so as a family, you made the move. As a family, yeah, we made the move. And um, so she she really didn't like NC State that much. So then she... Oh, brilliant. You just moved the whole Blinken family here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I ch you know, I'm living here because of her education. But then she transferred into UNCA, which is the University of North Carolina, Asheville. So we moved to Asheville where I am now is where I love. I will never, hopefully I'll never have to leave. <laughs> now people, you know, I've, I've moved around a lot, but usually I've had a job to go to before I was an audiobook narrator, obviously, when I was a regular working stiff, I've usually had a, a job to go to either a, an air conditioning job or then for, for almost 30 years, a radio job. Did you have work to go to all set up or did you just set off into the unknown and take a punt? That is the joy of being a writer. I can work from anywhere. Right. <laughs> and what it. about what about your husband? What what about him? How did he enjoy the journey? I mean, what does he do for a living? My husband works for the Veterans Administration, so okay. he travels to all the hospitals. So me and him aren't tied down to one spot. Great, great. That's really good, isn't it? That you can do that. You can, you, you moved, you know, for your daughter, which is, you know, that's a top parent thing to do. Yeah. And then, and then um, you, you, you managed to, you, you could carry on with your writing and, and, uh, and he could, his work continued because he was, a, he was on the road most of the time anyway. So that is I'm, true. Right. So I'm guessing it would have helped that you're in the same time zone. You're in the eastern seaboard as well. You didn't move over to the other coast. You know, it wasn't that drastic. Exactly. No, yeah. I like the South. I would not leave the South. I was raised by a very Southern woman. And when I, I have traveled up North, um, the Midwest, um, it's a different lifestyle. And I'm like, Okay, no, I'm just going to go back to the mountains. <laughs> well, your bio says that you, you travel to many places and you've seen amazing things. Tell me more. I have. Well, the first, the first book that I ever wrote, um, it's The Patient in Room 432. It was based in Louisiana. I did a lot of research, a lot of traveling research for the Creole culture, the bayous, it's about voodooism. So I traveled there a lot. And that is actually one of my favorite states in the United States is Louisiana. The yeah, culture, been... the food, the people, they're amazing. I, um, I, I once went to a radio convention in New Orleans. And instead of flying to New Orleans, my wife and I flew to Memphis. And then we spent a week driving down old, down old Highway 61, staying in Bates motels that we didn't book. We just hit the road. And we went through Louisiana and well, through Mississippi first and then Louisiana. And um, we met the, the friendliest people in, in, you know, to be fair, particularly with Mississippi, some of the, the poorest towns in, in the whole country. We met some really, really cool people and we did nice things. And we just like, we'd, we'd roll into town just before it got dark because I didn't like driving in the dark because you people drive on the wrong side of the road. And um, <laughs> we, we would go just say to the owner of the motel, what is there to do in town tonight? And often they'd say, oh, there's a movie at the community center. And we'd just go down there and watch a movie with all the locals. And so we met some, some you know, a lot, of, a lot of British people traveled to the cities in the United States, the big cities. But we found we met the nicest people in the smaller towns. And yes. uh, a lot of people don't it's realize that. About, and I found, you know, having lived in New Zealand and Australia, that in the, in the smaller towns, people are pretty much the same. You know, it's a very similar 
similar feel to, to, to all three countries. Britain's a bit different, but uh, in all three countries, I found that that's where you meet the nicest people. Okay, so you started talk. you, you, you mentioned about your first book and how Louisiana was where the, the inspiration came from. When you were yes. a kid, what were you reading then? Was it, was it that kind of stuff? Was it supernatural stuff? Because which the Witch of Monroe we'll get onto in, in just a bit, but because because that's got some some really dark stuff in it. That's that for me as a narrator was really fun to read. As a kid, what were you reading then? I started reading um, big book. I always call them big books. Um, the first book I ever read, I was ten years old. And it was the Jade Unicorn. And it was about a sociopath serial killer. So from a very at the age young of 10. age, at the age of 10, at a very, very young age, I was a huge Stephen King fan, John Saul. Um, I loved anything that bumped in the night. And so when I started writing, um, that was just the genre that, I just thought I would put myself into. I love it. And not it's not just the horror aspect of it. Um, because for me, the witch of Monroe, I would not put that in the horror genre, but I had to because the way they categorized the book. Um, but anything that has like a suspicious tale to it, that's me all day long. I love it. So how old were you when you wrote your first book? Actually, I was, it was in my 40s. Really? Why did it take so long then? You were, this is the stuff you're into. You're, you're spending your time reading it. You're right into it. There's all these authors doing this dark stuff. Was it a confidence thing or did life get in the way? I believe that it was a mixture of both. I did not believe that I was good enough um, to not only write the book, but publish it because on your first, my first book took me four years to write. And it was, am I good enough? Am I doing this right? Cause there are more, there, there is more to it than just sitting down and writing a book. You have to know how to structure that book, how the characters come alive, how it flows. Everything has to be perfect for your readers. Because mm -hmm. you're not writing this book for yourself. You're writing this book for your readers. Yeah. And I'm very um, dedicated to my readers. And so I think it was confidence, but I've been writing my whole life. I started um, journaling very young and I journal every day to this day. I have, I still have the journals that I wrote when I was 12, 13 years old. I'm going to give them to my children in my will. <laughs> and do you ever go back and read them? No, I haven't. I never have. I, I should one day, I always say that I'm going to, um, I would be quite interested in what my 13 year old self had to say. A lot I'm of sure. like, a, a lot of like self help people and, and I'd, I'd, I'd maybe go as far as saying psychologists, but I don't know. But they say it is a tremendously therapeutic thing to journal, uh, particularly regularly. Yeah, it, what, what, it, do, it, what do you get from it? Um, <clears throat> it helps with my anxiety because I have severe anxiety. Um, it, it helps with that. It just puts my thoughts out there. Um, it helps me. I think that it would help a lot of people that was able to do it in mental health because it doesn't, it's like you're not capturing all that darkness, that those feelings, you just get it out there. And whether you're talking to someone or writing it down, it really helps a lot. It really does. So I journal every day, every morning. That's the first thing I do. I get coffee and I journal. And so do you journal about the previous day then, do you? I do. I see. Oh, well, that's a, ni a nice idea because you've had time to sleep on it and just given it just enough just enough din distance for the perspective to be right because you're not in the middle of it, but you're still close enough that you've got a pretty good memory of it. Yeah, I, exactly. I get that. Yeah, I get that. I love yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always joke around with my kids and I tell them, 
you know, when you read my journals, you'll see all the stress you put me on. <laughs> <one day. laughs> yeah. Moving, moving out, moving hundreds of miles, uh, along, uh, through the country just to put yeah. you through Lincoln university. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. So the witch of Monroe, it's a fabulous book. It's, um, for me, reading it and reading it out loud, it had so many layers to it, but it had an overall, a, an eeriness or a darkness to it. There's a definite vibe that is more than words on the page. And I don't know how you created that. Do you know? So Hannah's story um, is very, very interesting. She, she lived in a time when women did not have a voice at all. Mm -hmm. And she was, I wrote a young Hannah Cranham. Um, Hannah actually lived to be 77 years old. Yeah, I was going to bring that up a little bit later on. There really was a Hannah Cranor, wasn't there? there she, it is a true, yeah, it's, it's considered historical fiction. So how did, you, though, how did you come across the, the real life Hannah Cranor? So to, I to decided it, to do a series of books, which I am doing. Um, and they're uh, part of an urban legend collection. And so I was doing massive research on these. Um, I wanted to do an urban legend for each state in the United States. Wow, um, 50. <laughs> yeah, people in the United States love urban legends. And so I was doing a lot of research, and I came across Hannah's story from Connecticut. That's their urban legend. And when I started researching her, it was more than just a legend it hannah hannah hovey was real she was a real woman and over the years just the gossip and the people they've turned her life into an urban legend so so i was really interested in her and i just did so much research on her and her story just spoke to me as a woman yeah. in a time when she she was young and she married an older man um, that wasn't nice. And then when he died, Although he was respected by the community, bizarrely. Of course he was. Yeah. Yeah, he was very respected by the community. But, you know, that's what happened back then. With, And it was long after, it was long after the Salem witch trials. Um, right. They they just mistreated her and he was mean he was mean behind closed doors basically you know yeah which and, and so was her mother she came from a, an abusive uh family situation too didn't she She did yes yeah. she did her, her mother yeah. was very mean and different and um i always when i did her research i always related it's kind of funny i related her mother to margaret white from the book of Carrie, she okay. was overly, overly religious. So, and sometimes, um, sometimes in religion, you can just take it a tad far. And I believe that Hannah's mother did. And mm. um, so when I wrote her, I always had um, Stephen King's Carrie, Margaret White in mind when I wrote Hannah's mother, even though she's a very small character in the book, I believe that her mother just was very impactful in the book as far as mm. Hannah was concerned. Mm. Now, the Christian faith, specifically at that time, which when is it set? When is the, the roughly the, the timeline for it? So I set her timeline uh, probably about the late 1800s. Okay, so the Christian faith in the late 1800s in small town Connecticut doesn't come out well in this book. Do you have a view on Christianity in small towns, either back then or, or in the present day? 
Because Christianity is a big deal in the U.S., more so than it is in Britain. In fact, statistics came out today that only one in three people in Britain describe themselves as being religious. And I think that number in the U.S. would be much higher. Do, but, but I'm just wondering on your view of, of Christianity, small town, maybe even back then, what, what is your, your feeling about that? Okay, so I really don't believe that there's much difference from back then to today when it wow. comes to Christianity, when it comes to women. Um, a lot have, has changed for women, of course, but um, I was raised in a Pentecostal household, which is like the Bible thumpers. Yeah. Um, over the years, um, I believe that in the United States, especially, and I respect everybody's Christian faith. I would never try to step on that, but I just believe that a lot of people, it's kind of like in the book when I said, you know, they, they beat their wives on Saturdays and go to church on Sundays. (laughs) Um, That's just how I feel about Christianity. I believe that um, a lot of people today, um, they hide behind their Bible and they, um, whether it's from their beliefs or from, you know, the LGBT community to um, the way that they raise their families. Um, it's just, I'm not, I'm very spiritual, but I'm not into the living by a book that has been rewritten a thousand times by man. Yeah. That's and translated just quite a few times too. As well. Very yeah. much. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. took it from, you know, the Hebrew language to this language to this language and, and it's written by man. So yeah. I just, I believe that your relationship with God is your relationship with God. Yeah. Because overall I got the feeling that the book was or a large part of the book was about prejudice in this case it turned out to be some religious or church going people who were prejudiced against a a single woman um it was did did i pick up the right vibe on that i mean there are some there's there is a lot in the book but but overall the book is a story of prejudice i think I agree agree? with you 100%. They they were totally against um, Hannah. Yeah. They didn't like her from the moment that Captain Hovey brought her to town. Yeah. She was different. And I wanted to base that book right when probably the end of the Puritans and and they just, they didn't like anything different. They didn't like, especially a woman like Hannah. She was beautiful. Yeah. She was different. She she didn't believe in what they believed in. So automatically that was just strikes against her. And then Because after, although the book is called The Witch of Monroe, she wasn't practicing witchcraft, was she? She was not. No. So she was, this was a label she was given, and this is part of the prejudice. Exactly. They completely stereotyped her. Yeah. And, yeah. and from that, they just mistreated her. And, and then Old Boreas, which is her rooster, um, they called him her familiar, which they thought that, she had this rooster that was helping her with witchcraft, witch, witchcraft, excuse me. But at the end of the day, old Boreas was basically her only friend. She was very lonely because of the mm. way she was treated. I always mm. looked at the book like it borderline mental health. Yeah. Like, cause a lot of people ask me, was Hannah a witch or was she crazy? And I always tell them, you're going to have to figure that out because (laughs) it's the way you take the book. Yeah. Um, I did write it differently than other books that I've written. Um, 
normally, you know, you have this climax and then it settles down. And then, but for me, for Hannah, I, chapter one, you know, I, it was up there and then I just went very smooth. And a lot of people have at, questioned me about that because there's not like much of an excitement in the middle of the book, they think, but they have to, I had to build Hannah's character that way for this mm -hmm. to work. I had to. And um, I enjoyed writing her story. I really did. It's probably one of my favorites. For me, she came across definitely in the second half of the book as a very strong woman. She, at the beginning, she is quite timid because she, she's, she's presented with a set of circumstances which at the time are, are quite devastating and frightening, especially considering her upbringing. But by the second half of the book, she becomes quite a strong... Uh, she becomes a strong person. Is, is she in any way a role model? So... They say that the real Hannah Crana was a warrior for women. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. They do because she did not allow the church to take her land. She did not allow the, the church to rule her life. She was a very, after Captain Hovey died, she was scared. She was, yeah. she had no idea what to do. She was lonely. She was alone. The town was against her. The church was against her. And then they started calling her Hannah Crana. Um, and she, I it believe. It was bullying. She, she was being bullied by the community. She was completely bullied. And I believe that when she found old Boreas, he just gave her strength that she didn't know she had and she mm. reached deep and she started fighting against that so and you think so you it's that, that she gets her strength from the relationship with old Boreas. okay i believe right. that she does yeah i believe and, that he gave her a sense of herself right right yeah and yeah. the character of Hannah, like I say, she's very timid at the beginning and she becomes stronger and stronger as the as the book goes on. Is she based on anyone particular? I mean, is there any of you in Hannah Crana? I believe that there was. I for really? me. I'm yeah, because so I'm I'm a very like I'm an introvert. I'm very shy. Um I like to stay to myself and um, I feel like through my writing and even if you're like that as a person, there's one thing in your life that will bring that strength out in you. For me, it's my writing. And, and I believe that as I got older and the more writing I did and the better I got, um, I believe that I have more confidence and I could stand up against the haters, I guess, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just something that I enjoy. And I think everybody has that in them. You just got to find it. And for Hannah, I believe that she found that in old Boreas. So what is the moral of the story? I believe that the moral of the story is be careful of the roosters. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think the moral of Hannah's story is the strength that she found. Um, she didn't want to change to be like everyone else. She didn't want to do what the men folk in town wanted her to do of Trumbull. She, she found strength within herself. She fought against the bullying. And in the end, um, I believe that Hannah persevered at that. I, I believe that she finally found herself and she didn't need, um, especially back in that time, um, she didn't need um, a male suitor to do it. She didn't need a husband to do it. She did it within herself mm. and she just yeah. fought against everything. I, I think by the end of it, you see that she's the only character in the book that actually is honest and stays true to herself. 
even though the opposite is being told about her, the dishonesty is with the other people. And even like the minor players, the shopkeepers and, you know, the other people, they are they are not being honest with themselves. They are not reacting with what as themselves to what's being presented to them. They're reacting in how they think the community will think of them. And I think that's a very dangerous way to live your life. Um, because who are you if you're just doing things to please somebody else? Hannah was there looking out for herself, and she was the only one in the book that was honest and true to herself, I, I felt, all the way through. She was completely like that. And the actual real Hannah Cranna was like that as well. She yeah. was so how, how much did you know about the real Hannah Cranna, and how much does she differ from the Hannah that you wrote in the book? Because you've got complete artistic license. Yes. So um, the real Hannah Cranna, um, they... They don't exactly know when she was born. They think she was born about 1873, which is a lot earlier than I based my book. Um, Hannah lived to be 77 years old and she did die of natural causes. Mm -hmm. um, she died, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was within 48 hours of the death of Old Berets. Wow. Yeah, he, wow. she died right after her rooster died. She, wow. um, and, um, her, her legend is that, um, right after Captain Hovey died, they nicknamed her Hannah Crana. No one really knew what it meant. Um, but what the real Hannah Crana did was she was a very strong woman and they say that she was one not to be messed with. She was, um, somewhat like Hannah in the book. They, after Captain Hovey died, they bullied her. They mistreated her. Uh, they wouldn't do anything for her. And um, in, in real life, uh, she lived in poverty. So she would barter with the town for firewood, for food. And they just, they just kept saying that she was a witch. And she wasn't. She just lived in this old cabin at the end of the road and and no one would help her and normally according to the bible you're supposed to help the widows so once again going back to the whole christianity thing where you know you drink on saturday and go to church on sunday i mean they just would not help her and so some people in town were scared of her. So she came up with this idea that since they called her a witch, if she acted like a witch, that more people would be scared of her and they would give her what she wanted. Yeah. And so that's what she started doing. And, um, and in my book, the pie lady, which was Emma Nichols. Yes. Um, in real life, um, it was her neighbor and um, she would not give her a pie. All she wanted was a pie. She was hungry. And um, so she told her one day that she was going to curse her not to ever make any pies again. And if they, she made them, they were going to be rotten and tasted horrible because she was supposedly the best pie maker in all of Trumbull. And um, the lady claims that after Hannah Crana cursed her, she could not make any more pies. So that's part of the legend then of the that's urban part of the legend. legend, yeah. And so I use that for Emma Nichols and um and then the whole um them screaming at her, Hannah Crana, that's a part of the legend. And I just I feel like I gave Hannah life. I gave her a voice, and that's yeah. what I wanted to do for her. Yeah. Well and I really hope that I did it. Oh, you did. It's a it's a terrific read. It's a it's a spellbinding book. It's it's a book that that takes you to places and when just when you think you know where it's gonna go, bang, it's something else she has to deal with. And the way she deals with it's sometimes shocking, but the way she's dealt with ultimately is shocking. Um so it it could be a controversial book and there are some some pretty heavy scenes in there, as you know. How yes. 
how did you find the process of taking your work? You've, you've done all this work and all this research. You've poured your heart and soul into it. Obviously, there's a piece of you in this book. Then you have to hand it over to an unknown bloke on the other side of an ocean. How did you find the process of turning your work into an audiobook? So I thought that, well, audiobooks are very popular. And um, I think it's the fastest it, growing thing in publishing um, at the moment. It is very yeah. popular. And I love audiobooks. And this would be my second audiobook. Um, and I was very, um, as you know, Graham, I was very strict. Yes. I got to read this book. And um, prior to finding you, I had another reader and he read probably like the first 10 chapters. And it just, that's not what I wanted for Hannah. That's it. He's a great reader. Um, I respect him dearly, but it was just not what I wanted and for this book. And some people even questioned me about, cause it's, it's in Connecticut, it's in the United States. And I found someone from the UK to read my book. And I told them for Hannah, I really wanted that because it's, you know, you think about the Puritans, the religion. And when you think of, think about like the witch trials, even though, you know, that's in the new England area, there was a lot of, um, Englishmen there. And, um, I really wanted that voice. I was looking for a specific voice and it took me forever to find it. <laughs> I interviewed, I had auditions, probably about 230 auditions. My and goodness. I sat there for hours and hours and, um, and I finally found Graham Mack and he read my book. <laughs> And you did a wonderful job. You put, it added, I believe that it added just a different layer to Hannah, that, that voice. It was, it was perfect. And, um, and the audio, I was, I'm very strict about the audio. Um, and we just, you go back and forth and back and forth and, um, Normally in audio, I don't know if you know this in the United States, they read the whole book. Then I have to sit there and listen to it. Yeah, I don't then, work that way. I, I work they, in they chunks. Do corrections. Yeah, oh my no, God, I, that was the best thing ever. I love yeah, I, that you did that. I always do that. I do the first hour and then you give some feedback and then I maybe make some changes. And I think in your case, I did make some changes. And then I do the book in two hour chunks. So you listen to two hours. And then I, uh, we work on that because I like to know that I'm on the right track. Yeah, I like and to, and, and you made, you actually made quite a lot of changes, but that's all part of it because it's your work and it's your vision. So I have to bring that to life. And the more we connect, and when I say connect, this is the first time we've actually spoken and seen each other. It is all it in is. writing, but when you write backwards and forwards to people a lot, I'm there trying to read between the lines of what you're saying, trying to pick up what it is you want, what it is you like, what's going well, what needs to be changed and, and change it. And I just think that's a better work, a better way of working together because you have to work together on this because it Absolutely. has to ultimately it has to be your vision. So I don't I, I can't even imagine. And I do work. I work with. All the ACX stuff, I do exactly like that. First hour and then two hour chunks. I work directly with a lot of agencies. Uh, one of them, actually, coincidentally, in Connecticut, uh, Tanta Audio. And they're lovely, but they do it a different way. They get me to do the whole book. And I've done 15 and 18 hour books with them. And then we do the corrections at the end. And I have the relationship with the agency. And the agency has the relationship with the author. So it's a different system. And for them, that works. But when I... When I work through ACX and I work directly with the author, it, I, I think, I think we get, 
well, I would hate to do the book and then have you go like, ah, it's okay, but it's not really there, but it's done now. It means right. that every two hours I have to answer to you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You no, know, I thought I love the way you did it. It was perfect because then when you're getting throughout the book, you have more characters. You have mm. old boy's voice. You have the devil's voice. You have Emma's voice, the, you know, the, the shopkeeper's voice and everything has to be different because in my mind, I was, um, I seen them in a certain way. I heard their voice a certain way. And, um, so the every two hour chunk, it, I think it worked out perfect for the both of us, to be honest. I can't work out why more narrators don't work that way. Um, just to, just to hand over the book and then, and then for the author to get hours and hours worth of work back when, you know, and there might be, you know, there might be a simple thing, like there might be a mispronunciation of a word. Well, that's exactly. going to be more work for the narrator at the end to change every single time than just pick it up the three or four times it ends up in those two hours. And then you know how it's said from then on for the rest of the book. That just makes more sense to me. I don't know why it's done any other way. I've heard that the the standard way that a lot of narrators work, and I don't know a lot of uh, audiobook narrators. I know some, but I've heard and I've seen YouTube videos of people trying to tell people how to be a narrator and what you do. And a lot of them will advise that you do the 15 minute checkpoint and then you get half of the money for the book up front and then you finish the book and get the other half of the money. Well, like, what? That's that's just that makes that makes no sense because something we didn't mention is I also you you pay for the one hour and then the two hour and you you, you do it gradually right. so that yeah. you only pay for, and I always say in that, my little blurb that I send out is you you don't you only pay for stuff you've listened to and you've approved you don't pay anything up front it's just stuff you've listened to and you've you're happy with and if you're not happy with it I'll change it until you're happy with it so exactly I'm glad you liked it that way because I I that that was one of my ideas when doing this was uh, I wanted to do it that way. And ACX seemed flexible enough. I've only had one author object, and it was probably my mistake. It was an author, I, I got a book, and we'd agreed the book, and I'd he'd made the, the offer through ACX, and I accepted the offer. And then after I accepted the offer, I said, look, this is how I work. And he was like, well, that's not what it says in the ACX contract. In the ACX contract, it says, you do the book, and I pay you at the end. And, uh, and I said, yeah, well, I don't work that way. He says, oh, I'm not really, ha I'm not really happy about that. I said, well, I don't work that way. And I ended up not doing it. Um, yeah. Because there's just too much can go wrong when you're turning in the whole book, I think. Yeah, a lot uh, I want to know they're happy with it as, as, exactly. as we go along. That's the only case. So now what I do is, after, is when I've got the offer, then I say, this is how I work. Is this okay? When the author says, okay, then I accept the offer. So th that yeah. one, to be fair to that particular guy who turned out to be a lawyer in real life. And so when he sees a contract, it's like tablets of stone. You don't mess with a contract <laughs> where I <laughs> think every, it. when I think that the whole goal here is just to make a great audio book. And if this is the way I work best, and if you can work like that with me, and most of the authors I work with, pref well, like you, they prefer to work that way, um, yes. then it comes out, that's the way it comes out best. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, I'm glad that's that worked great. for you, because uh, I'm, I'm constantly getting feedback, um, because I'm still new to this. Uh, it's been three years. It's been 177 audiobooks uh, to date. But I still feel like I'm still... Because every book's different. Every book is a new adventure. Um, oh, yes. New characters, new story, new author, um, all sorts. It's just great. But thank you so much for choosing me to narrate The Witch of Monroe. It is a fabulous, fabulous book. Um, a spellbinding book. A, bit, a, a book that that is hard to get away from. Like when I wasn't reading it, I, you know... Things would be going in my mind like, wow, <laughs> you know, how, yeah. what's, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's one of those books that's just, that's just with you, you know, there, there is yeah. a, it, it's, 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 you know, they use the word gripping, which is a kind of a, 
a, a hokey term now, but it really does it really does grip you. This book it's uh, it's very good. It's about prejudice. It's about the way women were treated, and in some societies and in some instances, the way women are still viewed in in, in certain levels of society. At at yes. you know, in in different ways. Some of them not quite as extreme as back then. There's been a lot of progress, but there's still a lot of work to do. But it, it is, is. Uh, it, it is great. It's called The Witch of Monroe. If you'd like to get it, if you're watching this on YouTube, there are links in the description where you can download the audio book from Amazon. And if you click one click back from that, you can even get the the e version, the ebook version of that. If you prefer to read it as an ebook, but it is, uh, it is amazing. Check it out. What's next for Tracy Murillo? You said you were going to do 50 of these. Is that, you're moving on? This one I see is, is number two, isn't it, in the urban? This is number two, yes. Yeah. Um, right now I'm working on the legend from Ohio called The Werewolf of Defiance. Love the title. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the late 70s, there was supposedly a werewolf that ran around the town of Defiance, Ohio. Um, it was written up in the Toledo Press. Um, it's another story that um, it's based on a true story, even though it's turned into an urban legend. Um, half of the town believed it was a werewolf, and the other half believed that it was a man dressed up in a costume. <laughs> wow. Sounds like so another, another winner to me. Sounds like another winner to me. The one that's out now is The Witch of Monroe. Get it as an ebook. Is it out as a physical book too? Yes, it is. Physical book, ebook, and of course, audio book. And I really enjoyed uh, reading it for you. It's called The Witch of Monroe. Tracy Murillo, thank you so much. Thank you, Graham. Have a great day. Thank you. You did a great job, Graham. Great. My well, son's listening now, and he's like, Mom, your e-reader is amazing. I'm like, I know. It took <laughs> me forever to find him. <laughs>